How many people, just real quick, a show of hands, have ever seen this definition for digitalization? I put it in here because this is something that the oil and gas industry talks about. This is their version of digitalization. Keep it very high level, keep it very simple, taking documents, photos, and, and basically digitizing them for the use somewhere in the system. For me, I like to talk about the top three things for digitalization must do for the employees. And really, it's got to make their jobs easier. It's got to provide instant results. and It must be easy to learn. For us, just real quick, we don't own any assets at Deepwater Subsea. We do BOP real-time monitoring for the, for the blowout preventers in the Gulf of Mexico. We do the compliance inspections for our customers, the drilling contractors, the oil companies. And our biggest challenge is we have to acquire the data like that asset is actually ours. And so I've taken an industry, which used to look like this, and tried to digitize it. And the challenge was, hey, look, we've used Excel and we've used Word for all these years. Why do I have to digitize? Why are we going to digital checklist? Why can't you just trust me that I actually did the work that I said I would do? You know, on the flight over this morning, um, I came across this definition talking about digitalization. And for me, I thought it was more fitting for this, for this conference, really talking about digitalization for the use in business and how do you change a process and improve the work that you already do. And for me, being that we're not asset owners, we invest heavily in technology. I got asked one time, what's the ROI on your investments for technology? I said, actually, it's probably zero. It's probably just my sanity that I can get the information as quickly as I need to, as easy as I need to. And the reason I talk about that is part of compliance inspections that we do with the blow-up preventers, we have to report back to the federal government. I had a flight last night, supposed to be coming in late last night. The government reached out and said, hey, we have some questions about some work that was done. We want you to go back two months and give us all the information on the work that was done on this blow-up preventer. If I didn't have that information readily available, it would have been a huge challenge to try to deliver the reports that they were looking for. One of the things I talk about all the time is today is not the day you should be worried about. Sitting here today is not where your biggest challenge is. How many people have seen the Deepwater Horizon movie by chance? So you're, you're probably familiar with both the Hollywood version and if you're dealing in the oil and gas industry, some of the things that took place. For me, this event hit home. I was one of Transocean's subsea superintendents. The Deepwater Horizon was one of my rigs. It was a rig that I went to multiple times. Six of the 11 guys that lost their lives were guys that I've worked with in the past. I actually worked with on other, some of the other drilling rigs that Transocean had in their fleet. The reason I talk about today is not the day you need to be worried about, is a year after the event took place, I was in the office in technical field support at the corporate office, feeding the legal team information. They would come in and say, hey, such and such testified, you know, we need to find this information. I'd say, okay, well, here it is. And then all of a sudden I got a call one day and I said, hey, do you have a suit? And I said, yeah, I do. They said, okay, cool. You're going to New Orleans on Saturday. You're testifying on Tuesday. This was on a Thursday. The challenge was, when the event took place, trying to find the information and trying to understand what the actual state of the blow-up preventer was, was impossible back in 2010. When you're trying to troubleshoot something that took place and you have absolutely no idea what the last state of that equipment was, digitalization, real-time monitoring, having that data feed coming in from the oil rig is more important than ever. We wasted a lot of time trying to troubleshoot because in the discussions we were having was, well, I assume that they did this, and then you would try something. Nope, that didn't work. Well, I assume that they also did this, and then you tried to troubleshoot that, and then that didn't work. Today, with the requirements for real-time monitoring in the Gulf of Mexico, it's mandatory if you drill in an oil rig that has a subsea blow-up preventer that you have streaming data coming back to the shore, coming back to a third party like Deepwater Subsea who analyzes and monitors the data as it comes in. So for me, being that we don't own the equipment, I talk about the, the asset lifecycle ecosystem. So we have the real-time data. We have to review the failure reports, look at the maintenance history. I also talk about the inspections that the OEMs are doing, third parties are doing. And then OEM documentation. And for me, this is one of the bigger areas, the new challenge that I'll talk about here in a couple minutes that I think all industries are facing. You might be the asset owner, 
well, what are you getting from the, the original equipment manufacturers as far as bulletins and alerts? And how fast can you get that implemented back into your system to identify potential failures that, that have been found in other companies and other regions in the world? So for us, we look at subsea operational excellence. So we're talking about the rig data, we're talking about compliance, we're talking about failure reporting and inspections. And our goal is to be able to push back out to our customers historical lessons, KPIs, operational logs, and inspection reports. How do we use digital information, our customers' information, and provide a service back to not only our team, but to our customers and the regulators as well? All of you guys are very familiar with, with process management, digitalization, you know, real-time monitoring of your assets. So for us, the blowout preventers are on the ocean floor. Some of them are halfway across the world, thousands of feet below the surface. We're getting up to five to 38,000 digital tags coming into our office, streaming real time 24 seven. From there, we have to turn around, visualize it, understand it, contextualize it. And if there's an issue that's going on in the field, think about pressure of having to make a decision. I have to call the oil company or call the drilling contractor and say, hey, look, you have a problem. You're gonna have to pull your blow up preventer. And every time you have to make that call, you're talking about millions of dollars that it's gonna be affected back to your end user, back to your customer. So when I talk about to, to our team, you have to be 100% sure of the call that you're making. Understanding what's going on with the systems is very important. So for us, we split it into two different ways. We have to understand what I call the brain of the system, the control system. How healthy is the control system as a whole? You're looking at faults, you're looking at alerts, you're looking at anomalies. And then you're also looking at the asset tracking of the maintenance history. Are they going CBM, they go in predictive, they go in calendar based, you know, what type of maintenance is that end user doing, that, that equipment owner? And then at the end of the day, we're, we're pushing out operational KPIs that we actually give back to our customers. One of the big challenges, as I mentioned, 2019, the requirement for real-time monitoring took place. A lot of companies didn't want to invest in building out infrastructure to have real-time monitoring teams, so they subcontracted to companies like, like Deepwater Subsea. What we then do is take that information, actually give it back to them like an extension of their technical field support. So we're working with them every day to try to understand what are your goals, what direction are you looking to do from asset management, what are your predictive analytics that you're looking for. And so we're heavily embedded with the, the actual equipment owners um, and the guys in the field on the rigs. If you think of asset management, you think of data, and the data tags that are coming in, one of the things for me looking at all the information that we gathered was very important is there's always one unique identifier that we can tag to each and every piece, and that is that asset ID number. And the more that we push that asset ID number across documentation, across asset history, as well as just the failure reports and the miscellaneous data, we can actually output a lot of information. And what we found was a lot of people had all of this information inside their infrastructures. They had a ton of data reports documentation, you know, it, it, it was just shocking to, to hear the same thing over and over again. Hey, we just took downtime on this issue. However, we didn't realize that we actually had 14 of these in our, in our fleet that we've also just taken downtime on because we couldn't react fast enough to it. So if you think of asset attributes, um, for us, we utilize the OSI soft pie system. That is our data historian that we pull all of our data in. It's actually the historian that a lot of people in oil and gas use. So for us, as an independent third party, it works good because we can interact with the customer's data seamlessly. So when we look at all the asset information, the basic stuff that I'm sure everybody captures, make, model, serial number, uh, the metadata, as I like to call it. What happens then is when you start to build out, you look at the CBM side of it, what is the date of installation? What is the date of manufacturing? What is the date of the last maintenance? In oil and gas, one of the big things and one of the big challenges was everybody always focused on one counter. That counter was what was the date that that elastomer was installed? Because of real-time data, because of the systems today, if I turned around and said, what was the date of installation? What is the date of manufacturing? What is the date of the last overhaul? What is the date of the last seal replacement? We actually run three, four, five, six counters at the same time to capture that real-time data. And so giving it back to our customers, looking at those data points where we can take one number, the functioning of that piece of equipment, change the date across different variables, we can actually provide better information back to them. 
So for me, the big challenge, as I mentioned before, is the, the who, what, where, and when. And as a business owner, I tell this to my team all the time, why does it have to be so hard? You know, we have all this information, we, we utilize servers, we, we capture tons and tons of documentation, and then the question comes up of, who is the customer for this job? Which surveyor went out on this, on this job for this customer? And now you're digging through all of this information. And you dig, and you dig, and you dig. The challenge is, with technology, it should be readily available at our fingertips. And then the last one, you get a phone call at 2 o'clock that says the federal government's looking for some information, and they want to go back three months. And they want to know everything that you saw while the BOP was on deck, everything you saw while it was being deployed, everything you saw when it first got on bottom, and all the anomalies that you've captured up until today's date being yesterday. They want that right now, and you got to be able to deliver it to them quickly. So as I mentioned earlier for us, this is a copy of one of our original BOP verifications. The nice thing about our industry is there's really no intellectual property when it comes to BOP inspections. We have federal regulations that we have to follow. We have industry standards that we have to utilize. So all of our competitors and, and, our, and ourselves at Deepwater Subsea, we utilize the same information. The challenge was how do you get out in front of the industry and really push the information that you have? The challenge to my, to my users, to my surveyors was every time we went out to a job, they had to fill these spreadsheets out. There's about 400 items on this spreadsheet that if you think about the guys in the field, in the office, it made a lot of sense. It was valuable data. We needed this information to help build out the asset structures. To the guys in the field, it was, I was just here three months ago. Why am I filling all this out again? With digitalization, with AI, with a lot of the different technologies that are available, what we've done now is actually rebuilt the entire process to say, OK, unless something's changed, don't show me the asset structure. Don't show me the asset structure because it's the same assets that were there three months ago. And this is the beauty of technology, is to be able to get away from a lot of this stuff to control the revisions of the documents that are out there and really be able to push regulatory compliance to another level. So for us, real quick, as I mentioned, we don't own any assets. A lot of the vendors that are here today provide us with the infrastructure that we use. And, and for us, it's helped us to accelerate where we are as a company and where we are as a service provider back to the industry. The reason I mention that is we actually looked at building our own technology five years ago when I started the company. And the problem was I wanted so much and we just couldn't deliver it. The joke in the office using some of it is I'm not a data scientist. I'm a guy from the field. So when you're talking about running an agile filter off a derivative off from this tag, the team just all look at each other like, what are you talking about? And it's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just put it in the system and it'll give us the information that we're looking for. Providing value back to your, to your users. So for us, when I mentioned the challenge of documentation, we use Hexagon's SDX platform. The reason for that is I can click on a tag, it gives me the documents. For the first time, I can actually associate an asset back to documentation. I can find it in an instant. I can provide bulletins and alerts and third-party documents, all just referenced from within inside. Integrating that into the OSI soft platform, now I get the real-time data. So for us, I show this because technology and the digitalization can come in a lot of forms. The digital checklist, being able to attach photos, be able to attach comments, be able to attach the dates, and to be able to pull it up at any time allows us to, when that call comes, to be challenged of what work was done, click of a button, I can output it in PDF and I can give it back to the, to the regulator. One of the big things with technology today, what we heard earlier about trying to troubleshoot and understand what's going on with an asset. I have a video here in a second. Keep in mind, I can't touch the assets that we're monitoring. They're thousands of miles away. They're sitting on the ocean floor. And so really being able to see the historical data and understand what's going on with it is very important. So being able to overlay trends, utilizing the Seek platform where I can pull in a data tag, capture it, and then overlay it on back data and then see that in real time to understand what's going on with the asset is very important. Kind of wrapping up, when it comes to troubleshooting a BOP control system, I, I always love hearing about systems that are, are very user friendly. And what I mean by that is, 
you, you talk about pumps, you talk about heat exchangers, you talk about things that have really one job. And I don't say that in a bad way for anybody that manages pumps and stuff. But it, it has its process, right? A blowout preventer, we have 112 functions that come off the same hydraulic circuit. Trying to understand which component is leaking is a huge challenge. For us though, when you take that digital signal, so this is a manifold regulator trend, and I can now bring in the digital state of the functions that were being functioned at the same time, when I can overlay them on top of each other, instantly I can see that that function is the function that's causing that leak. So when I make that call to the customer to say, your upper outer choke and your blowout preventer is leaking every time you go to the closed position, my conviction is not only based on data, it's based on historical knowledge and understanding of the systems, but it's the data that gets us to the next level. So kind of wrapping up, the next big challenge, how do you prevent failures from happening in your industry, in your fleet of assets that you own, when you already have the information telling you that the failure is coming? And what I mean by that is, for us in oil and gas, I think this will work. This is a blowout preventer on the ocean floor. We talk about P and F curves a lot in the industry for reliability. I don't get the chance to get to F. When it goes to P, you're pulling the blowout preventer. So trying to find out what's happening as quickly as possible, where you see the kind of the fluorescent tint is dye that's been pushed into the control system to be able to identify a leak. Because this leak was so small, you cannot visually see it with the, with the ROV, the remote operated vehicle. So we had to put dye in the system to try to flush it out so you could see it. Again, I showed this earlier. The big challenge, we're seeing bulletins and alerts that are coming out to say these parts are gonna be obsolete. And it comes into a, a maintenance manager or to an admin who says, ah, information only, and then they file it away. You have another one that says, hey, there's a product improvement because we're seeing downtime in the field. And a person doesn't understand, do I have these assets in my fleet? And they take it and they file it away. Last but not least is industry failures. Oil and gas, we have to, kind of like the aviation industry, we have to submit failure reports to a centralized database. You go through that database and there's hundreds of entries on the exact same product, the exact same component. And the funny thing to me is when you go pull the OEM bulletins and alerts, there's an alert out there from a year and a half ago that says, hey, if you don't rebuild this with new parts, there's a potential you're gonna see this failure. And yet people are seeing it all over the world because they don't really understand what's going on with the assets. So I think that the big challenge and the big shift, a new opportunity is, how do you take information in real time, load it into your system and have it look at your assets and say, hey, by the way, I have one of those. Not just attach it to the asset, but actually inform you, hey, there's failures that have happened in the industry, and by the way, you have 22 of these in your fleet. That to me is the next paradigm shift that I think is gonna happen when it comes to the digitalization. We have the information, we file it away, we do a good job of recognizing it at face value. However, you turn around a couple weeks later and then you find out that this downtime is happening somewhere else in the world. And it's a really sick feeling when you, especially as a third party, to see across multiple vendors, a failure happens, a failure happens, a failure happens, and everybody has the same bulletin alert. And then somebody goes, oh yeah, we, we got it, but nobody actually sent it out to us saying that it was important to action but now it costs them millions of dollars in downtime because they have to pull their blow up preventer back to the surface. Just kind of finishing up, so this is our real-time monitoring center. Um, currently we're monitoring about 25 rigs worldwide. Um, again, 24 seven, that's an older picture. Um, it's, it's interesting when you can actually see information in real time and, and really understand what's going on with the assets. And with that, I. Just want to say thank you for the time.